Welcome to Global Insights on the Lead, a podcast from New Lines magazine. I'm Kwango Liwewe. On last week's episode of The Lead, my colleague Faisal Al Yafai spoke to humanitarian and former CNN correspondent Ara Damon about her recent mission into Gaza with her NGO Inara. Damon gave us a grim assessment of the reality on the ground for Palestinians inside the Strip as Israel's war with Hamas grinds past its sixth month. This week on Global Insights, we're looking at the same conflict, but from a very different point of view. My colleague Lisa Goldman has just returned from her own reporting trip to Israel. There, she met an Israeli public largely supportive of the country's war in Gaza and the soldiers on its front lines, but much more ambivalent about the man leading it, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Lisa joins us today to examine the multifaceted, nuanced, and often contradictory perspective inside Israel today. Welcome to the podcast, Lisa. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Lisa, you've been covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since the early 2000s. In your coverage of the conflict post-October the 7th, what do you think sets this conflict apart and what led you to make the trip now? Um, well, I think it's unprecedented. Uh, Israelis feel for the very first time that their army uh, couldn't, felt that their army didn't protect them. It didn't protect them. And they had been living in a, they had been living with a very strong sense of confidence that uh, whatever happened, they were physically secure because they had such a well-trained army and and an um and and a highly efficient intelligence system and all of that broke down on October 7th and i think that besides the actual physical violence um that happened inside israel on October 7th um the fact that hamas was able to send fighters to actually occupy parts of israel for 2 3 days um and carry out these acts of violence um made israelis just feel incredibly vulnerable and they're living in the trauma of October 7th till now. Um, this was obvious to me even from a distance because I followed the Hebrew news broadcasts um, online. One of the things I've learned over the years is that the only way to really understand a story is on the ground. And I wanted to go and just talk to people, feel the atmosphere on the streets, have random conversations. Um, and what I think I'm slowly coming to the conclusion of is that um, it's a very interesting case study of what happens when people live in a state of hopelessness. And um, so, you know, that's always the question. You know, people always say, well, you got to have hope. Um, and and what I saw in Israel um, and also in Palestine was a sense of fatalism. Um, and I think, you know, everybody I spoke to seemed to be in a, a terrible state of um, nervous agitation. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, I would ask people, are you planning to leave the country? Are you thinking about it? Nearly everyone I spoke to uh, was thinking about it, but very few were actively planning. And as one friend said to me, um, you know, when you live in a place and you've got a tight knit family and a tight knit group of friends and your actual quality of life is good and you know that going into exile is going to be lonely and financially difficult, um, you don't make decisions like that. And so you simultaneously having no hope for the future, but being, as one friend said, everything around me is shit and my personal life is fine. And that's that sort of um, summarized the attitude that I encountered from most of the people who were not in the, the border areas on, the, on October 7th. Um, but from the people I interviewed who were in the border areas on October 7th, and not just in the Gaza envelope, um, but also up north, close to the Lebanese border, many of them are displaced and have been displaced since October 7th. And um, they are also living in a state of great anxiety. Um, do you want me to go on about that as well, uh, while we're speaking about it? Just tell me about the range of emotions and experiences you're encountering. So I'm just going to speak for a couple of minutes about um, the, the displaced people that I encountered. Um, so these the one and two star hotels along the more crumbling uh, parts of the Corniche, the, as they call it, uh, the Tel Aviv uh, sort of um, seawall uh, path, um, are packed with displaced people, who families who've been living there now for six months. And um, they don't know when they'll be able to go home. Uh, for the ones on the Gaza envelope, their houses have been, many of them have just, their houses were destroyed. And for the ones who come up north, uh, come from up north, the area is a closed military zone. So, um, and they have no information or clarity from the authorities as to when they will be able to go home. 
Um, so they're living in these crumbling, crappy hotels, um, whole families in a single room. Um, and, and somehow managing to just live day by day, um, with, you know, their meals are being provided by the government and their homes, their rooms are being covered by the government. But, um, you know, they they don't have any. Some of them have lost their jobs. Many of them have lost their jobs. They have no income, uh, and there was a lot of kind of very depressed people. Uh, one man came, actually followed me for blocks, speaking to me in Hebrew with a heavy Russian accent, and said he came from Sterot, which is a, a development town that's close to Gaza that was overrun with Hamas on October seventh, and um, there was pitched battles going on there. He's been displaced since then, um, and he just seemed really unwell mentally. He kept on following me and saying, could you just talk to me? I'm just so lonely, you know. Um, and I also spoke with families and they refused to say that they were having difficulties, um, that there were any tensions associated with living in a hotel room and the kids changing schools and away from their social networks for so long. But it was it was clear uh, it couldn't be otherwise. And of course, um, there's another aspect, which is the financial difficulty. Um, they are they still have to pay their mortgages and their rents, but they can't live in the homes that they're paying for um, by army order. Um, and I also, of course, interviewed Palestinian colleagues and friends and uh, the stories there. Well, we can talk about that. Where have you noticed that the Israeli public's views are the most united? And where do you think they seem to differ most drastically? I think there's a, there's... It's pretty clear that the vast majority of Israeli Jews, and I want to emphasize Israeli Jews um, because there's a very significant Palestinian minority in Israel, um, the vast majority of Israeli Jews do su do support the war. Um, and uh, that was, you know, the, as, as one friend said to me, um, she's also a former colleague, uh, she said, there, you know, we had to respond, don't you agree? You know, this was something that people are sort of that people who are whose values are more on the liberal spectrum um, simultaneously believe that the war is necessary. That they're and uh, while they're also not quite comfortable with what's going on in Gaza, but they're also not really looking at what's going on in Gaza. And in this ability to filter, they're they're heavily aided by the Israeli television news and newspapers, um, which simply doesn't report anything at all about what's happening to Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Uh, nothing. And I watched night after night of the news broadcast, which is 90 minutes during wartime. And a few times I felt like, I just want my 90 minutes back. You know, it was um, 90 minutes of domestic news and... Um, uh, human interest stories about soldiers who'd been wounded and were in rehabilitation and their grieving parents and blah, 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 which all of, all of which is, um, you know, playing into that national narrative of feeling victimized. But, um, you know, people are not watching foreign media. And so they don't, they're like, it's almost like a, a, a willful, it's sort of, they, they desire not to know what's happening to civilians in Gaza. If one didn't speak Hebrew and were just um, to parachute in to report on the situation in Israel um, and walk around and, and randomly interview people, um, one might come to the conclusion that the country is in a highly militarized state with absolutely no compassion at all for Palestinians and that these are therefore an, a, pe a people lacking in compassion. Um, in, and I, you know, I really really struggled to have deeper conversations with people without pushing them too hard or making them feel defensive. Um, and just sort of probe a bit, like, where do you get your news from? Do you know anything about what's going on in Gaza? Um, are you aware of the situation in Rafah? And slowly, 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 you know, you do get people nibbling around the edges of that of those questions and um, and saying that they have doubts. You know, that they're not quite comfortable, that they're protecting. It's clear to me that they're protecting themselves um, by simply not informing themselves about what's going on in Gaza. And they've they're towing the government line, which is that this is a necessary war. They need to feel it because they need to feel that their army is protecting them. It's all hugely problematic and very complex. And um, but there has been sort of a mass dehumanization of Palestinian civilians in Gaza. And it's. Um, it's, I had some, I had some difficult days. Yeah. Could you share with us what it's like for you on the ground, both professionally and personally, as you navigate through this challenging and complex situation? Um, well, it's a very good question, Kwangu, and I'm so glad you asked. Um, uh, 
to begin with, I had to be extremely careful with even with old friends um, to avoid talking about the war in a non-interview situation. Um, people are extremely on edge. They're very conscious. They're they're they. People express to me over and over again a sense of being very badly judged by the outside world. They feel very strongly that they are the victims. That the war is justified. They. The only deviation in the justified part that I heard was maybe not the scale of the response. So some people were uncomfortable with the scale of the response, but I didn't hear from anybody except for the radical left. And I'm, again, I want to stress, I'm not talking about the radical left, but within the sort of so-called Zionist, liberal Zionist to, to right-wing Zionist um, spectrum, which is not a scientific description, um, there was really, I didn't hear anybody say that they didn't think the war was justified. Um, so what they said was, you know, I'm maybe I'm really, un I've, you know, I've heard that some people are hungry in Gaza. And even on the Haaretz podcast, I, I heard one interview um, ask his guest on the podcast. Um, so do you think that um, is, is it is it true that there is starvation in Gaza or that there's famine in Gaza? And the interviewee said, well, there's hunger in Gaza. And I don't know if there's starvation. We're not sure. We're not, we don't, we're not sure if we have the data. And I thought to myself, my goodness, you know, we have, you know, the biggest NGOs in the world have data that show there is famine in Gaza. So there is this real fear of acknowledging that Israel might be doing bad things in Gaza, for lack of a better term at the moment. Um, and I was super uncomfortable with that. Um, I did visit some really close uh, old friends, people I've known for 30, 40 years, with whom I, I have very, very different political opinions from them. And we simply don't talk about politics. I set the Chinese wall, and they've been very respectful of that. But they had some guests around the table who expressed opinions that, you know, I have to say that when I was in Israel a year ago, if I'd heard those opinions, I just would have let my eyes glaze over and wait until they finished talking and then change the subject. Um, and and this time, I, I, felt, I felt really very uncomfortable to the point where I felt a little bit sick and I had to... I thought to myself, okay, don't make a scene, but find a reason to leave. Um, so, so there were those encounters. There were also a couple of encounters with friends who are on the radical left, but whose life chosen life partners don't necessarily share their opinions. And they described to me very painful, loud domestic arguments over the war, you know, and, um, uh, another person who's a journalist on the radical left told me, and I'm not going to mention his name because this was a casual conversation, not an interview, but he told me that at the beginning of the war, he was so afraid of the mob that he had a couple of nights of wondering whether he should reinforce the door in his apartment because um, this happened. He, he wondered this because one left-wing journalist who's a very rare creature, he's, um, he's, um, he's both radically left-wing and he comes from Israel's ultra-Orthodox community and he's a journalist. And um, during the first night after October 7th, um, his house, uh, his apartment building was surrounded by a mob that was shouting some pretty bloodthirsty um, slogans and threatening him. And the police had to actually spirit him out of his building and take him to a safe place with his family. And so my friend thought, God, what if, what if they come for us? You know, he had a toddler in the house and, and, and a newborn. Um, he said he feels much better now, but he had some very scary weeks. So those were the kinds of conversations I navigated. Um, and I also had to navigate those conversations with Palestinians. I went to Ramallah and visited some Palestinian friends there. And, um, you know, the West Bank is very, very volatile right now. Uh, it cost me a fortune to hire a private driver to get me through the checkpoints by circumventing them on back roads. And um, people there are one guy I know, I've known him for 20 years, he's a very experienced journalist, and I sat in his office and uh, looked out at the view, and he, he he pointed out that the settlement nearby was encroaching on his office in a way that I'd never seen before. And he also told me of an incident that happened a week earlier, um, where he was in a, his car with a colleague going to report a story in Jericho. And um, 
uh, he said that on the way they were suddenly surrounded by soldiers wearing face uh, coverings who had their fingers on the triggers of their weapons and told him to get out of the car. And uh, he's an unarmed civilian. And he's a very gentle, soft-spoken guy. But um, he said, you know, I've covered so many stories over the past few months of soldiers um, shooting and killing unarmed civilians in the West Bank uh, with no consequences that I genuinely thought I was living my last moments. And um, he said, I genuinely thought that was it. Goodbye. And he said, when they let me go, I said, thank you for not killing me. So for me, as an Israeli Canadian person with a ton of freedom of movement and the knowledge that I'm, I'm, only, I'm only visiting and that while I can visit my friend in his office in Ramallah, I cannot invite him to Tel Aviv and I cannot invite him to have coffee with me in Tel Aviv. Um, these, I had to be extra sort of, I was, I was extra careful, um, not to say too much, just to listen to people, whether I agreed with them, whether I felt shame or I, whether I felt compassion or whether I felt a sort of a loathing for their opinions. I found that, um, my only sort of coping mechanism, um, both professionally and personally was to say as little as possible and to listen and, um, try very, very hard not to judge or dehumanize people. And that is more difficult in this kind of situation than I can possibly describe. Um, so does your identity in any way influence the stories you choose to tell and the way you tell them? Yes, it does, um, but in very complex ways. So um, a lot of people uh, from the sort of center-right um, point of view on the Israeli spectrum um, kept on saying to me, you know, be tell our story, be fair, make sure that people understand our point of view. Um, and, and many times I wanted to say to them, I do understand your point of view, but I disagree with it. I want you to be more aware of the Palestinian perspective. I want you to be more compassionate about them. But I also was intensely aware that if I were to say those words, the interview would be over. So I couldn't and I didn't. Um, I do feel compassion for people who have gone from feeling very, very secure to feeling very insecure. But I also feel that a lot of these people who just live nice liberal lives in Tel Aviv and genuinely feel like they've never hurt anyone um, also were extremely complicit and um, are unwilling to admit or acknowledge that Everything we know about Gaza and the long closure um, and the siege and the situation in the West Bank, all of this information is in the public domain. So if if someone says, I didn't know or I wasn't aware that soldiers in the West Bank, you know, burst into the homes of Palestinian civilians who have done nothing in the middle of the night and take people away for interrogation and that that's a regular nightly occurrence. And we know that. I know that. I've witnessed it on many occasions. And of course, Israel has, you know, it's a conscription army. So any soldier who served in a combat unit knows this. Um, so to say that I didn't, to say, for someone to say that I didn't know that, that's like willful that's willful ignorance, and I have a really hard time with that. Does it affect the way I report the story? Yeah, it does. Uh, I I do tend to amplify the voices of, of um, people who are involved in the struggle uh, against the occupation. I do tend to amplify the voice of Palestinians, um, whether they be citizens of Israel or um, refugees from Gaza or residents of the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Um, I'm very, I've always in my reporting of any region, and particularly, particularly of this region, which I know so well, um, what I'm very interested in is amplifying the marginal voices, the less heard voices. And that's another reason, for example, and I'll, ra I'll wrap up this question with this final observation, that uh, I went, I, I wanted to hear what people were saying in the development towns where, where, which is where the sort of the, the lower socioeconomic um, class of Israelis lives, who have really suffered a lot from government neglect and, and were very hard hit on October 7th by the invading Hamas uh, fighters. And um, I wanted to hear how they felt and what their lives were like. And when I got there and I, I, I spoke to one woman just randomly on the street who was sitting next to the bus stop where a bunch of old people were shot to death uh, on that day on October 7th. And she said she'd had a full nervous breakdown and just was released from the hospital three days earlier. And, um, and she was just sitting there quietly next to the memorial candles on the bus stop next to the open door of the bomb shelter, which is always open, uh, and said, 
what can I do? This is my home. So. UN Israel just last week when Iran launched an unprecedented drone and missile attack at Israel. The eyes of the world settled on Israel as they waited for a response, which we're now possibly seeing unfold at the time of this recording. What was the experience like for you on the ground? Um, so that, that experience on the ground for me was astonishing. I was sitting in an apartment in Tel Aviv um, and uh, I was getting, my phone was, was heating up with all of the messages I was getting from friends and family abroad. Uh, they were panicking. Can I run to the airport? Can I get the first flight out? What's happening? Is there a bomb shelter nearby? And I said, there is a bomb shelter right outside my door um, and the door is propped open. But um, nobody went to the bomb shelter and the hysteria coming at me was because of the way the story was being reported abroad. So in Israel, there was no hysteria. People were not screaming on the streets. The restaurants and cafes stayed open. Um, and uh, there was a sense of sort of dark humor. I did hear military planes flying over my building, um, but the messages I was getting from my sister and from friends abroad was run to the airport, and I said, I might consider doing that if the airport were open, <laughs> but the airspace has closed, uh, and uh, there's no way to leave right now. I said, but I'm genuinely not worried, um, and apparently the... the uh, the the television news uh, in, in the states and in Canada where I live now, uh, the Chiron had big letters that said um, Israel under attack. And um, the next morning, you know, I got up. Um, I in in my typical bleary eyed state, I scuffed my feet into my Birkenstocks and um, wandered downstairs and and drank my double espresso with hot milk and chatted with people. And nobody actually talked about the previous night. Um, and I went up to Jerusalem that day, visited an old friend, and did a couple of interviews with Palestinians in the old city. Nobody talked about the rocket attack. Nobody. Um, and then with one friend, I said, you know, isn't it strange that no one's talking about it? I mean, we didn't even... I said, I slept right through it in Tel Aviv. And she said, well, she said, my kids were up all night long screaming. She said, I've been through four wars and I never heard such loud booms. The booms were from the uh, rockets being intercepted by the Iron Dome above uh, above the city. And, and then just after I made that sort of flippant comment, which I really regret, by the way, um, the person I'd been, um, the civil society activist that I'd scheduled a meeting with in Sterot texted me and said, please don't come tomorrow because my kids were up all night screaming from the booms and they're still traumatized from October seventh uh, and I just don't have the energy and and then I, I realized that not having children and um, not living there did provide me with a sort of a, a, a emotional a, a, a well of emotional stability and health that um, many of the people around me uh, simply don't have right now and um, and I did go to Sterot. I just didn't bother that poor guy. Um, but um, but I, I, did, I did understand that I'd been a little bit too sanguine. Speaking about being on the ground, what's the atmosphere like on the streets of Tel Aviv? Has the city come to a standstill? The city of Tel Aviv has not even remotely come to a standstill. Uh, the cafes were packed. Uh, every single restaurant I went to had a two-hour limit on the seating. They had no problem coming up to me and uh, with as I was sitting with my friends enjoying post-prandial drinks and saying we had to leave uh, because the next seating was had already arrived and the table was needed. Um, bars were packed. Uh, clubs were packed. Um, shops, boutiques. Everyone is well-dressed. Everyone looks very prosperous. Uh, the sun is shining. The beaches are full. The bike lanes are full. People are scooting around on those horrible stand-up scooters that make me feel like I'm under assault from behind all the time. Um, and if you didn't know that there was a war going on, you wouldn't know. Just by st landing in Tel Aviv and looking around, you would never guess. Um, yeah, except for maybe the posters of all the captives that are everywhere. How do these contrasting elements shape your understanding of the situation? And what insights have you gained from witnessing this complex reality firsthand? I'm still thinking about that. I've, it's only been a couple of days since I since I left, and I have um, something like fifty thousand words of notes that I took while I was uh, in Israel and Palestine. Um, 
I think that there's a lot to be said about, as I mentioned earlier, this this living experiment of people who are simultaneously living quite nice lives materially and in terms of their family lives and also feeling completely hopeless about the future. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about the very heavy militarization of Israeli society that we're seeing right now. Um, And also the normalization of extremely abnormal situations, which human beings tend to use as a coping mechanism, very evident in Israel. Um, there's uh, uh, also these, dem- there were demonstrations every single night in Tel Aviv, every single night. People were screaming for elections. They were screaming for the release of the captives. They were screaming for, for a negotiated deal to release the captives. The families of the captives in Gaza are beyond desperate. I mean, I, I saw the, the, these this desperate cadence as they screamed into the microphones at these demonstrations just begging and demanding uh, of the government to make a deal, whatever it cost, get their families, get their relatives out of Gaza. Um, You know, to see all these things juxtaposed in this small country of so many subcultures and so many strong opinions and so many guns, um, I, I, I have a lot to think about in terms of how humans normalize the abnormal, how they live without hope, um, and how easily people can ignore extreme cruelty and violence that's being perpetrated by their own army. And the lengths to which people will go to, um, for lack of a better term at the moment, say, la, 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 I can't hear you. Uh, That for me was extremely difficult. I'm still processing it. And I want to find a way to explain that, if I can, without dehumanizing anybody on any side. This week's episode was produced by Finbar Anderson and hosted by me, Kwangu Liwewe. For a deeper understanding of global news and current affairs, subscribe to The Lead on your favorite podcast app, where you'll find Global Insights the very last Friday of every month. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please rate us and leave a review. It really helps us to grow our audience. Thank you for joining us.